Hello, welcome everybody to the first class of this course. Actually, uh, in any introductory course, everyone is curious to know that why should I take this course. So, I will try to answer that question first through some two modules that what is the importance and the relevance of this subject in the engineering domain. Now, before we go to the subject, we must understand what is that we will be processing. We are saying that it is minerals, but before that we should know that what is the definition of minerals. Now, if you look at this textbook def definition, it says that minerals are natural, it has to be natural, available, inorganic substances, which should possess definite chemical compositions and atomic structures. I repeat it, the textbook definition of minerals is that these are naturally inorganic substances possessing definite chemical compositions and atomic structures. Is it really true always? No. There are some exceptions, like many minerals they exhibit isomorphism. What does it mean isomorphism? This means that where substitution of atoms within the crystal structure by similar atoms takes place without affecting the atomic structure. It may look little bit difficult to understand, but I will try to explain it with an example. Take the case of olivin as a mineral, it has got the chemical composition that is M G Fe 2 S I O 4, that is a chemical composition of olivin. But if you have olivins from 3, 4 different origins, you will find that the ratio of this M G atoms to Fe atoms, they vary in different sources that is olivine coming from different sources. However, the total number of M G and F E atoms in all the olivines has the same ratio to that of the S i and oxygen atoms that is silicon and oxygen atoms. So, what I am trying to say that, that although the olivine has the chemical composition the fixed chemical composition, but the ratio of M G atoms to F E atoms they vary in different olivines and this may be the cases, but what you will see that the total number of M G and F E atoms in all olivines they have the same ratio to that of the silicon and oxygen atoms. So, when we get this type of properties in any mineral, we call it that this is the process of isomorphism. Similarly, there may be polymorphism also. What is polymorphism? Now, in this case, the different minerals, they may have the same chemical composition but their physical properties could be different due to different crystal structure. When I give this example, you will all say, oh my goodness, we all know this. Like your graphite and diamond, they have exactly the same composition, being composed entirely of carbon atoms. However, 
they have got widely varying different properties. Why? The because it is of the how the carbon atoms they are getting arranged in that crystal lattice. So, that dictates the property or the physical property to be precise of that particular mineral. And when we see this type of characteristic into a mineral, we call it as a polymorphism, as a polymorphism. So, these are only the exceptions, but on an average we go by the textbook difference, uh, say actually textbook definitions of minerals. Now, interestingly the term mineral is often used in a much more extended sense to include anything of economic value which is extracted from the earth. So, although by definition they are not mineral, but we group them that is their productivity, their applications, their economics related issues, they are all tabulated with the conventional minerals. Examples a coal chalk, clay, granite, they all do not come under the definition of minerals. Like coal for example, coal is not purely inorganic, it has got inorganic part, it has got organic part, we call it, we call it minerals and minerals. But still our mining engineers they are trained in mining of coal also as well as the minerals. Even the mineral processing engineers who are busy in processing minerals, they also have good understanding about how to process the coal. Now, so what are these materials basically? So, these materials are in fact a rock sometimes we call it stratified rocks, which are not homogeneous in chemical and physical composition as our minerals do, but generally consist of a variety of minerals and form large parts of the earth crust. If we look at another example that is a granite, what it is? It is an igneous rock formed by cooling of molten material or magma and is composed of three main mineral constituents called feldspar, quartz and mica. These three homogeneous mineral components occur in ranging proportions in different parts of the same granite mass. So, what will happen? When the proportions are different, the properties, the physical properties of granite, they also vary. Look at coal. Depending upon its age, that is age of formation, it is in million years, not in few vivets. And what kind of processes they have converted our some of the materials into coal that dictates that what will be the physical property of this coal. So, relatively immature coal we say that is around 50 million years or something like that we say they are called pit relatively more matured we call it lignite or brown coal then depending on the your because the coal formation is basically a combination of different processes as the geologists say it is a prolonged heat and pressure for millions of years. And when the coal becomes more mature we call it bituminous coal then it has got some subdivision we call it sub bituminous 
and then we have got anthracite also. So, why do we classify them? Because the physical properties like are different based on the geological formation, their maturities and all this. Interestingly, if you see that what constitutes our earth crust, that only eight elements they account for over 99 percent of the earth crust. Is it not fascinating? Out of this eight elements, 74.6 percent is silicon and oxygen and only three of the industrially important metals like your aluminum, iron and magnesium are present in amounts above 2 percent in the earth crust. All the other useful metals they occur in amounts below even 0.1 percent. For example, you take copper. If the copper is evenly distributed, which is one of the most important non ferrous metals in the earth crust, its concentration is only 0.0055 percent. So, when they are basically distributed like this, that is with a thin concentration, that is, if they are distributed evenly all throughout the earth crust, it will be possibly Im uneconomically, it will be impossible to extract them. And just imagine that if we cannot extract them, what would have been the civilization. But we are very fortunate that these geological conditions throughout the life of the mineral they vary and this occurrence of minerals in nature is regulated by these geological conditions. And due to the action of many natural agencies like your rain, your uh, say your um, say basically the volcanic eruptions, then your storms, floods and all this. So, they carry these minerals, certain minerals and they deposit it to some other place where they are being concentrated. So, that is how the thinly dispersed valuable minerals, the nature has already helped us to get them concentrated at different zones. And because of that, it is now possible to extract them from the earth crust. So, it is a responsibility of the geologist to identify those resources that where they are basically concentrated. Then our mining engineers, they plan that how to take it out in a safer and economically viable manner from the earth crust. Then it is coming to the mineral processes that is how do I upgrade the quality of that. So, this is how this cycle goes on. So, basically the first concentration process has been done by the nature itself. Now, what happens with the development of the new discoveries and as a result of research? we could find many mineral deposits, which with the existing technologies, we say that they are 
basically amenable for upgradation for the further extraction processes so that we get our valuable metals out of that. So, and that is that we call it the ore. So, when a mineral qualifies for an extraction process and that is being dictated by whether the economics will be in favor of that or not. So, then we say that mineral is an ore. We we'll discuss more on this. So, if you look at the ores, the most ores are mixtures of extractable minerals and extraneous rocky material described as GAN. To qualify as an ore, it is not necessary that you have to have only that mineral only. I will give you examples. However, you have to mine some of the extraneous rocky materials also or our strategy is that let us mine it first and then we will discard the gang materials in due course of time with economically viable manner. So, based on the natural occurrence of this valuable mineral, we use different terminologies. Like sometimes we say that it is a native ore. Native ore means the metal is present in the elementary form. Elementary form means like example is gold, we call it it is a native ore. Then in some formation we say that we see that that there are deposits where you have got more than one valuable mineral available and when we deal with that we call it it is a complex ore like your copper lead zinc ore. You mine all these ores together and then we try to separate it out by subsequent processes. Then many times depending on the characteristic, depending on the chemical compositions of that ore, we also apply certain terminologies like we call it sulphide ores. That is when the metal bearing mineral is basically sulphides like CuFeS2, we call it chalcopyrite. So, that is a sulphide mineral. Then when they are in oxidized form, we call it that they are oxidized ores. Like we have got this oxidation state may be in the oxide ore like Fe 2 O 3, call it hematite. We may have sulphate, we may have silicates, we may have carbonates or some hydrated, hydrated form of this. So, all this we group together into under oxidized ores. Why do we do it? When I know that this is a sulphide ore, so automatically the strategy comes into our mind that oh, okay, if this is a sulphide ore, we should do this, 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 we should first try with this, this, this. If it is an oxide ore, we should do this, this, this based on our past experiences. And we also have an idea that what kind of waste materials we are going to handle, what kind of environmental problems we are going to handle or going to face. So, all these sorts of uh, something like your priori information we get when we categorize the ores in this fashion. 
sometimes the ores are also classified by the nature of their impurities that is the associated gang materials which we do not want, but it is unavoidable we have to mine that as I had already explained. So, then based on the characteristic of the gang materials sometimes we term them as calcareous like your calcareous phosphatic ores. So, when I am saying calcareous that means we have got CSCO3 that we have got limestone enriched mineral or the ore. Sometimes we call it your basic that is a lime rich and sometimes we call it siliceous or acidic that is silica rich. So, again the objective is same that is when we know that these the gang materials are calcareous or basic or siliceous or acidic we have our own strategy to try first that how do we deal with this. Finally, so what is the textbook definition of an ore? So, an ore can be described an ore can be described as an accumulation of mineral in sufficient quantity as to be capable of economic extraction. So, when we start mining something we must ensure because mining is basically business we have to make profit out of that. So, if our entire mining operation, why do we mine it? We are mining it to sell it. Who are my customers? Mostly the metallurgist. So, what is their requirement? I must know that. And what is the value I will be getting? What is the price I will be getting? So, how much is the cost I have put in in the mining? And what is the return on investment? F it is positive then only we say that this is an ore. So, that means a mineral to qualify as an ore has to have sufficient quantity as to be capable of economic extraction. So, here I have said sufficient quantity. So, you may ask me Sir, what is the sufficient quantity? 5 percent, 10 percent, 50 percent? Yeah, that is a genuine question. Now, this minimum metal content we use one word that is called grade or the sometimes assay content. So, the minimum metal content required for a deposit to qualify as an ore it varies from metal to metal. What does it mean? You will be surprised to know that gold may be recovered profitably in ores containing only 5 parts per million of the metal. That means, in one ton of material whatever you mind, if you have 5 grams of gold that qualifies for a very good quality gold ore. Whereas, for iron ores containing less than 15 percent metal as of now it is regarded as low grade. So, to sum up how much is the how much quantity is the sufficient quantity? I will reiterate by sentence that it varies from metal to metal. What is the market price of that? So, you see that in case of gold even 5 ppm concentration in one ton we say that this is a ore. 
whereas for iron ore even 15 percent metal content does not qualify to be an ore. So, what is the definition basically the mining engineers or processing engineers they apply or even the geologists they apply that whether this is a mineral deposit or this is an ore. So, a deposit will be economic to work and can be classified as an ore deposit if the contained value per ton is greater than total processing cost, it includes geological exploration, mining, mineral processing, even metallurgical extraction plus in the process how much you are losing that is the losses and other cost per ton. So, ultimately if I make a profit out of this then only it qualifies to be an ore. So, in my next lecture I will explain this in much more detail that what are these total processing cost losses and other cost and what is the role of mineral processing. Thank you very much.